When I go on a road trip, if it's in Coral's car and it's on the open highway and you can do 100 kilometres an hour, I spent, because in Coral's car, my ute doesn't have this, but in Coral's car, it's got one of those, you know, what do you call them, a speed thing you can set? What is it? Cruise, cruise control, yeah. So I set the cruise control, depending exactly where I am, but round about 105, 106, like, you know, just, I, I set it at a, at a spot where I think I won't grab any attention from blue lights. That's about where I, I set it, right? Um, so I deliberately, like, bend the rules without engaging with those that keep the, law, the rules, right? That's, that's my plan. Now, most of you would never do that, right? I know you would. Yeah. You set it fractionally higher. You're a, you're a risk taker, right? Um, but, but most of you probably don't do that. But in some area of your life, you'll get as close to that invisible line as you can. And you're thinking, well, what line? Well, the line between responsible and irresponsible, the line between illegal and legal, the line between moral and immoral, between I'm in control and, oops, I think I, I need help. Why do we do that? Why do we, why do we, why do, why do we, well, back in the garden, God had one tree that he drew a line around. And there's this bias within us that just wants to push against the boundaries, to, to cross that line, to go over the boundaries even. We don't want to get hurt, but we want to get as close to being hurt as we can. Now, every time I go spotlighting, when I walk out the door, these are the words that Coral says to me. <laughs> For those that didn't hear that online, it was don't shoot yourself. <laughs> she never said that. She, she trusts me in that area. But she says these words. Be careful. And sometimes she really looks at me, she says, be really careful, right? What, what, what is she saying in that moment? She's saying, don't get too close to the line between safe and unsafe. Create a margin of safety so that if something goes a little bit like you're not expecting it, you, it it's still gonna be okay so that it's not dangerous so that something bad doesn't happen. She's, she's saying, don't take unnecessary risks. Don't push it to the limit. Now, the other night, our little two-year-old granddaughter was bouncing around on the couch, and then she jumped up on the arm of the couch, and she was dancing around on that. You should have heard Coral's response. It was, Remy! Like, it was panic, it was, it was Remy almost at the top of her voice, it was Remy! And, and, but little Remy, she was having fun. She was okay, she wasn't hurt, but Coral could see something could go horribly wrong, and so Remy had no margin of error in her little two-year-old mind for what she was doing, she was just having fun. And, and, and if, if you're the parent of a teenager and you go to them and you say, look, I'm worried about how much time you're spending online, who you're talking to, what, what you're becoming addicted to, if a parent speaks to you about those things, what, what does a responsible teenager say? It's okay. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's, it's, it's okay. I've got, it, I've got it under control. But see... It's even as a parent, it may not be that you're worried about what they're doing is wrong. You're worried about the direction this could take them. You're worried about there is no margin for error. See, nobody is doing anything wrong until they are. You're in control until you're not. You're, you're sober until you're not. And if, and if you love someone and you care about them not getting hurt, you want to speak up. You, you want to help protect them when you see them going in a certain direction. 
And if you can see, there's no margin for error. And the issue isn't, is it right or is it wrong? Is it legal, illegal? The issue, it's really an issue of whether it's wise. Now, that's a word you will not find on social media these days much because it's, it's, wisdom is something that our culture has fallen out of love with. It's something we don't talk about much. Um, and when, but when it comes to making decisions where we live with fewer regrets, it's, it's a question worth asking. And this is the question. What is the wise thing to do? See, an option can be not wrong and it can be unwise. Yesterday, my brother Jeff was culling a whole lot of his roosters, and Jeff breeds show quality birds, right? And I have some of his good hens at home. I thought they needed a rooster. I, I'm addicted to breeding things, and I'm thinking, this is a brilliant idea. I'm going to get one of Jeff's spare roosters. We'll chuck it in the pen there, have little chicks. The grandkids will love them and all that stuff. And then I ask this, myself this question, what is the wise thing to do? And I'm thinking at 4 o'clock in the morning when that rooster's crowing and Coral says to me, get rid of that thing, I'm not going to get it in the first place. So I came home without the rooster. Because that was the wise, the, I can see that little clap. Thank you, Anne. That's, that silent clap is all I need from you, Anne. Just the, I made a good decision, didn't I, Anne? Yes, yes, yep, yep. Um, I put some margin back into our world just for a moment. I, I took a step back. And, and sometimes if we can take a step back and ask ourselves relationally, financially, in every area of our life, is this the wise thing to do? When, when Jesus told a story about two builders, and he, des he described one as being wise and one as being a fool. And it was based entirely on the directions, sorry, on the decisions that they had made. But the story has nothing to do with like a construction site. It has everything to do with the way we build our lives. There are moments in life when we would give anything to go back and relive that moment, to undo what we regret. And every regret that you carry, I guarantee in your life, the things that you wish you'd never done, it began with a series of unwise decisions that led you to that place. And you would agree now, looking back, that they were definitely unwise decisions, but at the time, you just kept making them and they took you in a course that you don't want to go back to. According to this uh, American writer and philosopher, Albert Hubbard, I, Ant, it's not, no relation, no. He was born in 1856, about the same year that, no, 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 no. Well, this guy, I don't know why they write these things and quote them, but it's just a quote from this guy. It says, every person is a fool for at least five minutes every day. Wisdom consists in not exceeding the limit. <laughs> that's, his, that's his philosophy on wisdom. And, but I don't think Paul, who wrote a big chunk of the New Testament, would actually agree with that. Because this is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. There's no five-minute rule. Like, there's no way to be a fool one moment and, and wise the next, he's saying, no, nah, no, nah, be careful how you live so that you live your life wise all the time. And then he, gives, he says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. He, he could be describing 2021 here in Australia. He's saying, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. And then he gives this, this one example. He says, don't be drunk on wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a don't do list. It's actually there's a better way. There's a better way. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I have a confession. For the last 25 years, I have been addicted to watching Judge Judy on TV. I love Judge Judy. She's 78 years of age. When she stops doing her thing, 
I'm going to grieve. I don't know what I'm going to do. I record every program and I only watch them once and I, can, I know if I've ever seen it before. And, I, and what Judge Judy has taught me is the difference between wise people and fools. There's one episode on Judge Judy where they had a, f- a family from Texas that was suing their neighbour because their 17-year-old daughter was home one day by herself and she heard all the chooks squawking down the chook pen. And she went out and there was this Alaskan Malamute in the chook pen that had killed 34 of her chooks. And every Texan has a gun. So the 17-year-old girl goes, Pew! kills the dog. And then tried to, because they knew it was the neighbour's dog, they tried to get the money for the chooks back from the neighbour and the neighbour said, not my dog. So they end up in front of Judge Judy. And what happened in the court situation was that it, it came out that the dog was shot at 4.30 in the afternoon. At 3.30 in the afternoon, the neighbour put on Facebook, we've lost our Alaskan Malamute. Has anyone seen it? It never, it never did come back home. And, but this person standing there going, it's not my dog. It just happened that there was an Alaskan Malamute shot an hour later in my neighbour's place, but it wasn't, wasn't our dog. And then Judge Judy asked for a photo of their dog. And she has a photo of the dead dog. And she's matching them up. And there's a cheek mark that was exactly the same. But the neighbour said, no, it wasn't my dog. It's just... And see, you can... And Judge Judy said, do you, do you realise you've just been a fool? <laughs> There's millions of people watching you and you're, a, you're looking like a fool. And I discovered that a fool, you can give them information that's true, but they just reject it because they have their own idea of what reality is. And no matter what you put in front of them, they reject it and choose the reality they've made up in their own mind. But see... A wise person, if you do the same thing, they will assess the information you've given them and if they can see truth in it, they'll adjust their reality and they'll add this new understanding to the world. And, and Jesus, when he told the story about a wise man and a fool, it's a very graphic word picture and it's in Matthew chapter 7 and he says, "'Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise.'" That's Jesus' definition of a wise person. And he says that sort of person, when they, it's like they're building their house upon rock, on a solid foundation. And when all the stuff of life comes at you, all the stuff you just never saw coming, when that comes, you're still going to stand. But he says, anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't put them into practice is a fool. They're like the neighbour that says, not my dog. You reject truth for your own reality. And Jesus goes on to say that when the rain, when the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jared Hain, Christian NRL superstar, has just begun a maximum five-year prison sentence for rape. And if you look at all the things, the decisions that happened in the lead up to that thing taking place, a whole series of very, very unwise decisions. And now the regret that he carries. So we build our life one decision at a time. It's just how it works. It's, it's just how it is. In the early years of spotlighting, the reason Coral now says to me, be careful, is because in the early years, I went through a lot of vehicles. I destroyed quite a few vehicles. In fact, I hurt a few people, including probably myself. And Coral's words today of be careful added to my own growth and understanding in that area, right, Um, has now created a better experience for anyone who comes spotlighting with me. We basically stay fairly safe. I know the other night Steve Sparrows got some bruised ribs, but that was an exception. 
the rule used to be someone got hurt, someone got thrown overboard, Pete's shaking his head, you've been out with us, Pete, Colin, you have too. Risk life and limb. But now it's basically safe-er than it was, right? Consistently safe-er, right? And when... Some, for, for, all those, for all those watching out there, I, I apologise for this heckling that's going on here. I'm, I'm trying to get a point through, right? It's better now than it was. <laughs> Can we delete that bit? Right. When Paul says in Ephesians, be, be very careful how you live, he's not saying try harder. He's not saying do more because it might be actually do less. He's not saying be more committed. He's actually trying to rescue us, to help us from getting hurt. I had this Hilux ute and the Toyota ads in those days was unbreakable. They were wrong. I broke it and it was fairly new. And while it was being fixed at the Toyota shop here in Bensdale, they, in their own wisdom, loaned me the shop ute, a Holden ute. <laughs> so, so, so we took this Holden ute spotlighting. And I can remember we were chasing this fox and I got a ute load of blokes up the back with not strapped on, no safety stuff around anyone. And as we came over this rise, there was a red gum stump that should not have been where it was. And when we hit it, we sort of went airborne and when we nose dived into the ground, we sort of bent this Holden ute into a little shape like this. And that ute had a six cylinder motor in it. It's meant to be like that, but it was like that. And the Toyota dealers felt that I should pay for that ute. <laughs> it's a regret that was really hard to process because we were newly married. I'm trying to pay for the previous car we've bent and now I'm having to pay for this ute. Paul's instructions about living carefully, living with wisdom, not being a fool. Do you know what's remarkable about what he says in Ephesians? It's what he doesn't say. He doesn't give us seven steps to how not wreck a ute. He doesn't. He doesn't give us an accountability group. And I know, I know all that can be helpful, but that's not what Paul gives us. There's no rules to keep. It's just so simple. Be wise. Don't be a fool. Every opportunity requires making a decision. And Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. And we make the most of every opportunity, the decisions we make by asking this question, what's the wise thing to do? And to make that decision, Paul explains us that it needs a sense of understanding what God's will is. And Jesus said that if you hear what I say and put that into your life, that's wisdom. And Paul tells us how to do this. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not out there on your own. You're not having to do this yourself. The Bible is so clear that if we want wisdom and we lack it, to ask and God will give it to us. He'll guide us by his spirit. He'll help us. And, and in the decisions that we make daily, Paul tells us that our world will not help us. That our world at the moment culturally is working against us. Once in Australia, if you want to raise your kids in a, with a Christian worldview and Christian way of seeing the world and with Christian values, our community supported that. That's changed even since when I was a kid, right? My grandkids are having to deal with stuff that I never had to deal with. Growing up, if I wanted to look at a scantily clad woman 
in a picture form, I would sneak into the local news agents and you sort of walk past that aisle, you know that aisle that they had, and you try to look into a little magazine without getting caught. And then they got very clever, they put those magazines in plastic sh covers. Today, that stuff chases me on my phone. I don't, I don't have to go looking for it. it, it, it comes looking for me. And I'm not asking for it. Because of my role in, in Red Gum, and, and, and we've got, I get friend requests from all around the world because of where this thing goes in Never Never Country, and I don't know who they are. And sometimes they have strange names for women, and they don't wear a lot of clothes. And so I have an option. Friend request accepted, friend request deleted. What's the wise thing to do? Like, only yesterday, I had someone, and I, I don't know, I didn't know which way to go. So I just pressed, denied, whatever you do, right? Because that's the wise thing to do. Accept, delete. It's such a small thing. It's such a tiny thing. But it's the direction it takes us. Every opportunity requires a decision that will go either that way or that way. They're just six little words. What's the wise thing to do? God, help me. Help me. Help me understand what's the wise thing to do. Because he will. He will guide us and he'll direct us. Do you know, it's such a brilliant concept what Paul has here in Ephesians because wisdom, God's wisdom, is based on three foundations and you have them right now in your life. You have those three foundations. The first is past experiences. You know you. You know that you're vulnerable in certain areas. You know that... You struggle with some things. That's brilliant to know that because that's a past experience that you can use what's the wise thing to do. See, six weeks ago, I stood here bravely and said I'm going to lose 10 kilos in 10 weeks. Well, I've lost six kilos in six weeks so far, right? <laughs> now, now, that's the wise thing to do for my health. That's the only reason. So often in life, we only make the wise decision when that's the only option left, right? I'm trying to be slightly ahead of the game. I should have done it a long time ago, but six kilos in six weeks. But see, I know in my life, I am vulnerable to certain things. I know that if I drank alcohol, it would have been a problem for me. I don't drink. I never have, but the way I'm wired... See, some personalities are more susceptible to some things than others. What someone can do, I can't. So what's the wise thing to do? That's what you know about yourself from the past. But then your, your present circumstances, you know that life's like this. One day you can be really angry. And, and maybe the best thing to do at that moment is to do nothing. Sometimes when we're overwhelmed by circumstances and fear grabs us and, and we're anxious and we're tired and we're worn out. What's the wise thing to do? Well, it may be the same thing as when you're angry, not make a decision in that time. And the third part that helps us understand wisdom is understanding what, what beats in here, what's the hopes and the dreams for the future. If you get kids... What's the dreams for your kids? So when you're making decisions and you're thinking, how will this affect my kids? What's the wise thing to... If you want to get married, if you want to buy a house, what's the wise thing to do? It's not a question about what's right or wrong. It, it's a question that's designed to help you make wise decisions and not foolish decisions. To not live with regret, to not have stories that you would never tell because you don't want people to know. Imagine the difference of living a life 
where you ask yourself the question, what's the wise thing to do? It doesn't matter how you ask it. What's the wise thing to do? What's the wise thing to do? What's the wise thing to do? What what's the wise thing to do? It doesn't matter how you ask it, but just ask it. When my daughter Mandy was 17, there was a night Coral would rather forget, and I'm going to finish with this story. It was traumatic. Coral doesn't even like to think about this night. And our daughter came to us and asked us if she could put on a little party for her friend who was leaving town. And we said we could, yep. I made a barbecue. We set up a sound system in the backyard. And, in fact, it was these, those big suckers there. We had sitting in the backyard. We had music thumping out across the paddocks. It started at 7.30. But what I didn't know, my daughter had photocopied the invitations and she'd handed them out to anyone at the secondary college and at Nagel. And about eight o'clock, all these maxi taxis turned up and cars turned up and we had 200 young people rocking up in our backyard, all with backpacks full of grog. And it was really, <laughs> Coral's at the back shaking her head going, no, don't tell the story, don't tell the story. And so what do you do in that moment? I rang one of our youth leaders and came out and said, we need a bouncer, we need some help. And, and things got a little bit out of hand between two guys that night and, and they were trying to take each other's heads off. And I remember seeing my 17-year-old daughter get between these two blokes and stop a fight. And I remembered at the end of the night after everyone was gone and all the damage had happened and all the stuff had happened, I remembered thinking to myself, how do I respond to my 17-year-old daughter? What's the wise thing to do? So I went up to her. I remember putting my hand, arm around Mandy. I said, you know, Mandy, I'm so proud of you tonight. For the first time in my life, I saw God's leadership gift on you. I saw you welcoming people. I saw you stopping a fight. I, I, I saw something in you I've never seen before. What I saw was God's gift upon your life. It's leadership. If she tells you that story today, that's the moment she remembers. That instead of punishing her and dumping on her, the wise thing in that moment was to see what God had within her. We, we had to refine that, you know, get it going a better way. But if you want to understand why sometimes I lead the way I do, why I make calls sometimes in leadership, where I'd rather give someone an opportunity sometimes before they're ready, it, it may not always seem wise to some, but I think God's heart, is to believe in people even when they don't believe in themselves and even when they've let others down sometimes. I think God's wisdom is different to our wisdom. And Ant, that's why you're up here this morning, mate. I believe in you. I've, I've believed in you when you haven't believed in you. And, and a few years ago when we looked at starting Red Gum, I honestly believed in my heart of hearts that you'd be part of this. And today's the first time you have been. And I'll tell you what, it's so powerful, so fantastic. Love you. Yeah, let's pray. God, I thank you that you love us, that you believe in us when we don't believe in us, and that you can give us wisdom when we have none. And you can help us make decisions that we won't live with regrets over because We've listened to your voice and your Holy Spirit's guided us and directed us. And I thank you for that. I thank you for what you add into our life that we don't if we're just open and willing to ask that question. What's the wise thing to do? Thank you, Lord.